and uh, only the brave survived the third day. How many of you are on your third day here? Wow, excellent. I'm on my third day as well. Good. Okay, so this is a, just a brief whistle-stop, light-hearted tour of history of radiology. History of any scientific uh, sort of ex uh, specialty is a very good area to explore because it also shows you where the future lies as well because a lot of things will change in our careers and your specialty and the domain of your subspecialty. So it's worth looking at these areas uh, in a slightly more pragmatic way and in a slightly philosophical way. So when uh, Professor Qureshi asked me to do this initially, I was thinking, why? What's the catch here? What, what do I have to do? But when I started looking at radiology as a specialty, it was amazing. It's a very new specialty, novel specialty. The history only goes back 120 years or so, and most of you are aware of, uh, this is Homer Simpson, obviously, that's the present. Uh, our radiologists have done an fMRI on the Homer Simpson's brain, and it's still evolving. And that's a reflection of what radiology is. Most of you are aware of this uh, basic history that's uh, of start from school uh, days, actually. What I also want to draw your attention to is the fact that a lot of these uh, radiology-related or radiography-related or radiotherapy-related uh, domains have won multiple Nobel Prizes, and some of them have uh, even won more Nobel Prizes in one person. So it's absolutely amazing, the history. This you know, this is Ranjan's uh, uh, x-ray of his wife's hand with the wedding ring on it, and it was slightly incidental discovery or accidental, and then obviously rest, as they say, is history. Um, he, he worked in a lab alone for a quite a short time uh, to push this through, and uh, then eventually uh, that was the birth of standard x-rays. Follow on from that, at the same time, there was another guy called Nikola Tesla. What's Tesla important for? Where does Tesla come into our lives? Yeah, and what, what in MRI? Absolutely, yeah. And what strength does it go up to now? Seven. So it's, it's a bidding war, but 1.5 is your standard, so 1.5. Now, look at this guy, Serbo-American uh, engineer physicist. How many of you will be able to claim this? How many of us will be ever able to do this? So um, he actually has multiple uh, things to his name. He even has a $100 bill with his face on it. Um, he has been named one of the 100 greatest men in history by Life magazine. Um, he has a crater in his name uh, on the moon. Now, that's another theme that you'll see. There's, these people have put craters in their name in the galaxy somewhere, which you wouldn't find normal people doing really. Um, follow on from that, slightly moving slowly on from there, uh, people started thinking, well, this guy's done the hand. What about the rest of the human body? Let's look at the brain. And look at even in a prim pr very primitive x-ray, the detail of the gyri and sulci that has come through. That's the x-ray of a foot. Look at the date. That's within one, two years of discovery and invention. So it's born and it's already running, so it's not even walking now. Um, then they started looking at x-rays with the portable option. So they, these were x-ray boxes and x-ray tubes, which were the looking for, because TV was rife, so chest uh, x-rays were probably the most important ones that were required. Um, then people were started fantasizing about looking inside human beings, so these studios started to come up on X-ray studios. So instead of taking pictures, people started taking X-rays of people's bodies. Uh, obviously, some uh, imagination ran amok, and there is still that anxiety with X-rays. This is Man when Manchester uh, Airport put on the X-ray scanners. That was the BBC article. But there's no worries like that at all. Um, 
So obviously nowadays uh, there are airports in uh, Europe where you don't even have to take your belt and shoes off or take liquids out. They can look through you and look through your luggage without much problem. So the accuracy and the intensity and the, uh, and the contrast of the imaging in x-rays is phenomenal. So uh, imaging itself is the massive growth area still, despite its early beginnings. You can't talk about history of radiology without talking of radioactivity because that has been incorporated into this. So when x-rays um, were invented, within a few years of that, within 10 years or so, people realized that both x-ray radiation caused cancer, plus they could also cure certain uh, skin conditions, and that's where we were. So people started looking at the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum to see what could be used, what could be used for diagnostics, what could be used for therapeutics, what could be used for imaging. And that I don't need to go into details with because I don't understand it myself. Uh, then look at this guy. This guy is uh, actually known almost as the father of uh, radioactivity, Henry Becquerel, and you would all know his name. So another Nobel Prize in 2003, in, uh, 1903, 116 years ago uh, in physics, uh, and he was famous for this unit. So they have units in their name, craters in Moon and Mars, and they have faces on $100 bills. How many of you, can you raise your hands if any of you have that? No? I don't, and I don't aspire to that. I don't exp I would hope it'll ever happen. But this is, this is another crater on the Moon, and a crater on the Mars. The Moon wasn't enough, so he needed another planet. And then look at this family. We have very eminent families here, and I think there's very eminent families in history. So it is actually a very sort of linear uh, lineage of talent, knowledge, and I think a lot of uh, investment in academia, essentially. This, this, isn't, this isn't an easy career to build. Uh, and obviously, look at the uh, lineage. Look at another Nobel Prize there. So multiple Nobel Prizes here and there. Come forward a little bit more, and you look at Marie Curie. This lady is one of the only people in history to win two Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines, physics and chemistry. Now, that's not really easy. I wouldn't think it is. And then he marries this guy who's another Nobel laureate. Marie Curie's history is very interesting. Again, it's worth a read. Uh, born in Warsaw, moved on to France. And the family actually thought we, they would support the other daughter to study medicine. And they couldn't support Marie to study medicine. So she went on sideways. And then she moved on to Paris. She um, we used to work with this guy called Paul Langevin, who will come back in the talk a little bit later. Pierre, her husband, died in a freak road accident being run over by a cart whilst crossing the road because he was probably busy thinking of his uh, uh, science and then just got run over. And then there was an allegation of an affair with a co-worker, which still happens in this modern world as well, and that got her pretty depressed and uh, didn't lead to anything, but obviously that wasn't a nice thing to be associated with at that time. She was an innovator, not just an inventor. She sort of went around the, during the First World War developing radiology cars and portable x-rays. And, you know, you have the portable MRI scanner parked here. How different is it from this? It's a portable x-rays in those days. That was the most modern thing. Interestingly, she used to distill pitch blend in her um, garden shed in the back garden. So she used to get that and to get uh, radium. And radium used to glow in the dark. I don't know, any, have any of you seen clock dials which glow in the dark? Yeah? So I'm of that vintage, so I have seen them. And historically, they used to put radium on the little markings. And uh, young ladies used to do it in the States. They were called the radium girls. So uh, between, say, 16 and 20 years of age, they would be in shop rows and they would be licking the brush to make it thin and mark them. 
Around 1980s, they started developing signs of jaw cancer. This was, this was so much after Marie Curie died of this. So they started developing jaw cancer, and historically, they were treated extremely badly. And the case went on and on and on till the last one was about to die. I think three or four uh, only received a pittance for the damage that was done. But anyway, to cut this long story short, radium is to glow in the dark. So she used to carry the uh, test tube of radium in her uh, lab coat and then used to put it on her bedside table at night. And that apparently made her develop uh, a plastic anemia and, and from radiation exposure. I'm not sure if it's just that, but there will be much more in her work. And uh, she died as a result of that. So I just mentioned about portable scanners. This is Doncaster. This is Doncaster. This is Northern General Hospital. This is London. Anywhere. And look at it. There's hardly much difference. But it's just the technology inside. But the thought processes are similar. But they're getting more and more portable. Apparently, some, and some apps are looking at developing uh, some sort of imaging at a very low uh, level, but in a very highly portable uh, way. And that would be amazing. Comes the Second World War. A lot of things uh, changed during that time because of oftentimes military uh, expeditions and military science allows a huge amount of unaccounted investment and unethical experiments uh, to go through. And at that time, you would see loads of inventions and discoveries and innovations have come through in the physics uh, domain. Um, so people were getting a bit more inquisitive, so they thought, well, we looked at bones and uh, sort of solid stuff, but there are many hollow organs running in the body. So why don't we put some contrast, image, contrast within that to get some imaging uh, done? So they started injecting, firstly, in birds and other animals into the esophagus and the gullet, and then they started looking at the vascular, vascular, vascularity. Uh, and then from that was born contrast radiography. And in this day and age, you use all these regularly, as, uh, even now, with minor modifications. Computers started coming in. Computing technology was getting better. So they thought, oh, if you have two different types of images with contrast, why don't we take one away from the other to see the difference and they get the contrast levels much higher? And obviously, digital subtraction and geography is still pretty uh, much in use for the vascular domain as well as the uh, cerebral vasculature, the renal vasculature, and, and, and any other bit that you can think of. Look back at ultrasound. This, goes, this actually goes back a long way. This goes back to the great man, Leonardo da Vinci, 1490. He was the first to actually think of uh, sonar and ultrasound in, in, as a form of energy which is reflected, which we could capture to listen out for boats, bats, and things like that. But it wasn't until the war era that we looked at it again as a technology that could be of use both for the military as well as for medicine and science. Remember this guy we talked about and this? Um, they worked on the development of active sound devices detecting military activity, submarines, in, the two, in, in 1915. Come forward again to the UK. Uh, UK, it's amazing. Uh, the history of radiology is actually a history of science in Britain as well. It's absolutely amazing how much uh, British involvement there has been in the development of this domain. Um, this guy is absolutely unique. Another guy you could read up uh, for your bedtime reading if, you, if you're that way inclined. Um, look at him. Electrical engineer biologist, inventor, and a medical doctor. He studied botany and medicine in Cambridge, specialized in what's now called STD, joined the army, created the wild tube. Have you guys, any of you seen, heard or seen the wild tube? No, what looking at it? That's, that's an absolutely amazing, simplistic solution uh, to bowel uh, distension. But I, I would look it up if you're down in London and, and any of the museums as well. 
Then he was the environmental eco-warrior at that time. Look at that. Uh, but not really current eco-warriors would be horrified at burning charcoal, but obviously big change from gas. Cited in the Guinness Book of World Record for the wrong reason, world's largest defamation award in 1990s. And he has a commemorative stamp. Then ultrasound became better and better. The resolution was better. So now, if any of you were having a baby, they could show little Johnny's face before he was born. And you can match when little Johnny comes out that whether he looks exactly as he was in the womb. And it's very, very close match. So who could have thought of these things even about 30, 40 years ago? The role of ultrasound has grown significantly. It's diagnostic. It's also therapeutic. And it's also guide, a guide to multiple other things which we uh, do. And Professor Qureshi's talk will also cover a bit of it in the neck, which is a huge role for us. Uh, and I'm sure in the other head and neck domains, you'll come across the, ultras the role of ultrasound. It's a big, big role for us. And so many other specialties. What I'm trying to say here is that there's a queue of multiple specialists outside the radiologist yeah. domain. So if you have, uh, if you need a friend or if you need a list of friends in the hospital, the first one would be, for me, the radiologist. If you know the radiologist, you can ring up and get a very quick review of your scan. There's nothing like that in this world. It's, it's worth its value in gold. So I think when uh, Dr. Dugar comes, make a friend immediately, instantly today, make a queue, uh, say hello. But I would say, and then Dr. Uh, Professor Hoggard, and that's exactly what I do. I, I make sure I meet them. You see them in uh, MDT clinics and meetings, and make sure that you have a two-way communication because your radiologist know, needs to know what you want from them, and you need to tell them what you exactly want from them because there are others who are also needing their time, which is quite precious, and the resource is precious as well. So the Doppler monitor, you know that, uh, and... Um, the color Doppler slowly coming in. Look at the uh, detail that comes through. And 3D ultrasound. Ultrasound in therapy, the dentists use it quite a lot. The renal physicians use it quite a lot. And that was actually removing need for multiple other operations as well. So the radiologists are after our jobs as well, so be careful. Um, CT scan, moving on to CT, another British invention. If you're looking for research funding, don't go to overcrowded areas. Go to somewhere which is less crowded. This is classic one. The CT was actually the research and the development was developed from the um, royalties delivered from the sale of the Beatles music by EMI. And they helped in developing this. And look at another Nobel Prize for Sir Hounsfield. Uh, and obviously, the Nottingham unit is named after this great man. 3D CT scans are phenomenal. They give you so much detail that you don't really need to go through anatomy books. If you're teaching anatomy, sometimes you might want to use CT scans in 3D to show them uh, the results and, and match them with your MRI. This guy had a blunt trauma to the neck. The hyoid had dropped. We couldn't work out from the uh, uh, endoscopy, and this told the story nicely. This went to court because this was an assault. It was a great asset for the prosecutors, and the, it, the, for the judge, it was easy to work out where the damage was and where the threat to the life of this patient was. It's absolutely amazing what your radiologist will do for you if you ask nicely. Again, 3D reconstructs don't require much to be left to imagination. We deal with superior semicircular canal dehiscences, which are, again, slightly complex affairs when you have to explain to the patient. They have got multiple symptoms. How many of you have heard of superior semicircular canal dehiscence? Yeah? So they come with multiple, about 10 symptoms, autophony, they hear their own footsteps, they have a fluctuating uh, conductive hearing loss, they have bobbing oscillopsia, they have occasional dizziness, etc., etc., etc. So most people find it hard to diagnose, and most people find it hard to explain when they diagnose it. 
But if you show them a scan which has been done in 3D and reconstructed, and you show them that this, this is the base of your brain, this is a halfway through your skull, and this is the balance organ, which should be plain bone, and it is actually open, and it is being uh, influenced by the... Uh, by the brain moving up and down. It's much easier for them to understand, whereas if you say, oh, the valence organ's peeping up into your brain and it's exposed and all these things are happening. So a scan, I'd like a picture, speaks uh, volumes compared to words. So if you have a very good 3D reconstruct, it's a very good educational tool, both for patients as well as for students and junior doctors. The also, the important thing is it's, it's a medical legal value. You might know certain things are there, and definitely you are, your diagnostic accuracy is great, but you might want to still confirm it and also want to look for any other complications or uh, spread of disease around it. So even if the diagnostic accuracy clinically is great, you might want to just check that as well. MRI, very briefly. Again, look at that, another Nobel Prize. Uh, Obviously, two people shared the price there, uh, but actually, another, this is another typical bit in medicine and science. The guy here was actually ahead of these guys and had uh, almost discovered MRI at the same time and looked at the same values, but he was bypassed in the Nobel Prize. He was a very aggrieved man. Um, MRI as a diagnostic tool for uh, medical uh, reasons is another story uh, for British invention. So the Sir Peter Mansfield is, again, hugely credited for this. Uh, MRI details, uh, you can get as much detail as you want nowadays. We can ask for a 3D reconstruction of the labyrinth, and our, our radiologist will give that, and you can look almost at the details of the cupola and the 3D uh, imaging structure. The MRI scans are now being used to diagnose many years in a very small few centers. It's not really come through as a standard diagnostic tool, but it's very, very crucial that you will be looking at this uh, in the future. We use uh, MRI scans routinely for cholestatoma diagnosis. If you look at that, it lights up like a bulb. As I said, it's not a def don't, you don't have to have MRI for diagnosis, but it confirms it, tells the patient what it is, where it is, and how big or small it is, and where it's going. fMRI looks at your thought processes and brain working through the metabolic route, and we use that for a study on tinnitus. The imaging of the tracts and functional imaging has been so good that it made it to the cover of Gray's Anatomy uh, as such, uh, I think, a few years ago. Radionuclide imaging, you know all about it. Again, this will be covered in detail for parathyroid, and that's a fantastic story to talk about. If you look at PET CT, PET MRI, and the combinations, they are absolutely wonderful for recurrences in cancer disease. So these are, it's a checkered history, and it's amazing how many things are continuously being added and innovated. Intervention radiology, as I said, it has taken over multiple surgical options, and of course, stent, as stents classically were, you are one of the commonest uh, examples that I can cite that has taken over vascular uh, surgery uh, and also neurovascular surgery. Stereotactic radiosurgery, again, works through radi radiology and the 3D imaging and the planning, as I said. It's absolutely amazing. Now, the number of skull base operations have dropped as a result of that, but you couldn't have done it without being able to plan with high-end radiology. Simulation. How many of you have used the simulator like a Voxelman? Yeah, just too few. I think there's quite a lot of simulation available. In, in uh, Yorkshire and Humber, we have a Voxelman. Uh, you, you might want to make use of this, especially in your junior years. It's not that great in senior years, but it's worthwhile. It comes from airline simulation technology. First one was Lockheed Martin, and look at how it's been applied. And obviously, there are multiple simulation courses as well. Simulation allows you to plan your surgery. We use this for implants regularly. The radiologist tells us where to put the implant quite nicely. They love it, and we enjoy doing it safely. Navigation is another one. Robotics, et cetera, would not be able to work without imaging being done accurately. Now, there are 3D imaging tools which have layover. You can operate 
uh, having a look through uh, augmented reality and mixed reality. In the US, they've started looking at these booths as well. It's in a tech technological fair where you can go in, get yourself imaged, stood in the booth, pay uh, through a slot machine, and get your biometrics done very, very easily. Uh, robotic assisted, as I said. Uh, AI is the big threat for that now because there's so much big data being collected as a result of imaging. AI, as you know, works with pattern recognition. So the risk now for its success is that it may well be a victim of its own success. A lot of basic radiology is up for grabs for AI, and this man is very interested, as are Google and Watson. So that was a quick whiz through. And look at that, life's changing very rapidly there. So again, a rethink for radiologists to get super specialized like we have. Uh, Watson um, has looked at multiple scans, and their accuracy is as good as some of the very experienced radiologists, as well as uh, another example is retinal scan. So I don't know what the future is. I don't think these tell you the future. and. It's a bit like cricket. I think you will know um, only when the results are declared. So you have to wait. OK, thanks very much.